chapter 11, and uh, we'll get into some things, and uh, just, just some things I think would be helpful for us to remember as a church moving forward, and so uh, especially as we move into this busy time. So let's go to the Lord in prayer, asking to bless tonight, and uh, we'll get right into our study, and then uh, we'll have some time for prayer and uh, some discussion stuff for VBS when we're done. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, as we come before you this evening, Father, we want to thank you for the beautiful weather. Lord, we thank you for bringing uh, Miss Sammy home safely. Lord, we ask that you would continue to uh, be with her and her family, give them the peace that only you can provide. Father, we thank you for watching over and protecting Izzy on her flight. Uh, Lord, we thank you for uh, the time that we have to spend with her. We ask that you would just uh, help the girls to enjoy their time together. Lord, we thank you for those who have uh, gotten off work and uh, made a point to be here. Lord, we thank you for them, and Lord, I ask that you would just uh, bless them and their desire to be here. Father, we thank of those who are unable to be here, whether work or other things uh, that needed their attention. Father, regardless of what it is, Father, we ask that you would just be with them and watch over with them, protect them. Uh, Lord, uh, extend to them the grace and the strength and the mercy to uh, be faithful and to continue to serve you. Uh, Lord, we, uh, we are so fortunate to have the freedom to gather together, and we uh, don't do so half-heartedly. But Father, as we go into a time of Bible study and a few things for us to keep in mind before we get into a busy season, Father, I ask that you would give me the clarity of thought and discernment to present your word in a way that is helpful. Uh, Lord, in a way that is not distracting, uh, Lord, we ask that you would speak to our hearts. Uh, help us, Father, to, uh, to understand better uh, your expectations, and uh, Lord, how to better serve you. And Father, we ask that you would uh, continue to work in the hearts of those who will be at the revival. Uh, Lord, we, uh, we sure need revival on personal level and, and on every level. Uh, Lord, we, we need it. Lord, we need to uh, be reignited with a passion to uh, serve you and to preach the gospel and uh, make sure that uh, everyone that we meet has an opportunity to hear how much you love them and the gift in your son. Father, we ask that you would just continue to uh, work in all of our hearts and those that will be here so that you will be honored and glorified. Father, we love you. We thank you so much for the opportunity to gather together. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Acts chapter 11. Acts chapter 11. So, with, with the revival and the missionaries coming in, uh, I had... And, and, I had decided to, after finishing Jonah, I had been asking the Lord to help me out these last couple of weeks before, before I preach for two weeks. I, I won't be preaching for two weeks after tonight. And um, I just asked him to lay something on my heart that would be helpful so we're not wasting our time, so we're not just checking something off the, off, you know, checking the box on something, right? And, um, and he did that. He did exactly uh, what I was uh, desiring him to do. And so we're going to read Acts chapter 11, verse 19, excuse me, through 26. And uh, I want us to, to notice just some tasks for the local church. Three, specifically. Three things that we as a local church uh, need to, uh, or should be reminded of as we prepare to go into a busy season it's kind of easy to lose sight of, not lose sight of our identity, but it can be easy for us to lose sight of what we're supposed to be doing. And we just have so many things going on, right? I mean, we, good grief, we didn't even talk about the parking lot. You know what I mean? So we got people coming in and out. We got visitors coming in. We've got uh, family coming in. We've got contractors potentially coming in. We've got, right? I mean, we have a lot of stuff going on, and it's just stacking one right after another. Now, that's great. We can't be accused of idle hands. 
but we need to be mindful also that we don't let that routine of busyness cause us to forget who we are and what our purpose is. And so I just believe that God would have us just look at a few things uh, before we get into this busy season, just as a reminder of what we're here for. Okay, so look with me if you would, Acts chapter 11, verse 19. Verse 19, now they which were scattered abroad upon the persecution that arose about that arose about Stephen traveled as far as uh, Phinis and Cyprus and Antioch, preaching the word to none but unto the Jews only. And some of them were men of Cyprus and Cyrene, which when they were come to Antioch, spake unto the Grecians, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number believed and turned unto the Lord. Then tidings of these things came unto the ears of the church which was in Jerusalem. And they sent forth Barnabas, that he should go as far as Antioch. It's kind of interesting, right? Because Sunday night we looked at Barnabas being called out of Antioch. <laughs> so this is Barnabas being sent to Antioch, <laughs> right? So it's kind of interesting. Verse 23, who, when he came and had seen the grace of God, was glad and exhorted them all, that with purpose of heart they would cleave unto the Lord. For he was a good man and full of the Holy Ghost and of faith. And much people was added unto the Lord. Then departed Barnabas to Tarsus for to seek Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him unto Antioch. And it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people. And the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. You've heard that, right? The popular verse. Well, where did the word Christian come from? We were called Christians all the way back at Antioch. All the way back at Antioch. So, three tasks of the local church to look at tonight, okay? And uh, I will do my best to be mindful of time. I have, uh, what do I got here? 716 on my watch. Yes, it's a little bit fast. Uh, but I got 716. And uh, so, with the Lord's help, we'll get through here. But the, remember that the church, the, the Greek word for church is ekklesia, okay, called out assembly. I know you know this, we just, we want to, for, for thoroughness sake, we want to make sure that we work through, okay. It has the idea, the word ekklesia <clears throat> being a called out assembly, has the idea of a local, visible, organized assembly of believers, okay. So, so it is an idea of local visible, called out, and organized, okay? And, and obviously, who, who's it made up of? Believers, okay? We're called Christians first in Antioch. So, essentially, it's this. The, the church is a possession of God. The church belongs to God, okay? It is His. And you say, well, I thought Jesus said He would build a church. Yeah, well, Jesus is God. It's His possession. He owns it. Okay, by this, uh, we mean that simply that God is the owner of the church. Okay, that's it. That's what it is. Matthew chapter 16, upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So Jesus tells Peter, upon this rock, I will build my church, mine, showing the possession, the ownership. Acts chapter 20, take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers. Holy Ghost has made you overseers, right? To feed the church, the church God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. Okay, what are these verses showing us? It's ownership. So understand that the church is a possession of God. We as a church belong to God. Paul calls it the church of the living God. In 1 Timothy chapter 3, the pillar and ground of truth. But think of it this way. God himself is the CEO, the president, the sole shareholder, if you will. That's it. It's his and his alone. Now, we do say this is our church in a sense that we make up the body, right? Uh, but actually, more accurately, we are the church and we belong to God is actually more accurate. But yes, we are part of the body, clearly, okay? 
but we're, we, we're bought with a price. We're paid for. We belong to God. The, remember, the church is the people of God. It is saved, baptized people of a specific, local, visible assembly. The church is local, not universal. Okay? It's not. The church and the kingdom of God are two different things. Okay? They are two different things. <clears throat> The church, the church is part of the kingdom of God. But they're two different things. One is here. One is earthly. One is okay. We're not one big conglomeration of Christians. Big group of Christians from all around the world with different doctrinal positions. Okay. That's not the church. It's not. The Bible says nothing about the church being invisible, meaning that you can't say, oh, this is, this is where they meet. This is the church. You could walk in here and people would clearly say, oh, this is the church. Right? You can see that. The Bible says nothing about the church being invisible, where everybody belongs to the same body and everybody has the same pastoral leadership uh, or they can have biblical fellowship in spite of doctrinal differences or philosophical differences or theology differences. The Bible says nothing about that. It is a local, visible assembly of believers. Saved, baptized believers. That is the church. Okay? By definition, that is the church. It's not a parachurch. The church is not a denomination. The church is not an association. The church is not a fellowship. Do we have a denomination? Yes. Do, but do we, um, but we don't belong to an association. We're not here to fellowship. While well, fellowship is part of what we benefit from gathering, that's not our motivation, right? That's not our purpose. The fact of the matter is this, is that we need to remember, especially going into a busy season, that God desires for his church to be glorious. It's a glorious church without spot or wrinkle. He expects us and desires for us to bring honor to him. God's plan for, for this day and age, the, the church age, the age of grace, is that the church is his supreme representative in the world. And we need to remember who we are. Because that's who we are. We are a possession of God. Put together to, to represent him to the world. This church is God's church. It's been God's church since day one. And it will be God's church till all of us are dead. You following me? Everybody follow? I know it's Wednesday night, so stay with me, okay? Stay with me and I can get through this. We're committing, we, we are committed, heritage that is, we are committed to doing what God intends every local church ministry to do. He intends for us to win people to Jesus, disciple them in faith and their, their spiritual growth, to, to build the church, right? So he adds to the church through us out reaching people and discipling people. Pray, we pray for laborers to be sent. We ordain men to gospel ministry. We plant churches. We make a difference in the community, but all for the glory of God. Acts chapter 11, verse 19 through 26, the text that we just read is about the, the seed beginnings of a model church. It's the very beginning. The it's about the development and the spread of the church movement beyond the original setting of Jerusalem. We have Barnabas leaving Jerusalem, right? Going to Antioch. He goes to Tarshish. Gets Saul, right? Saul goes to Antioch, right? There's this moving around. And we saw Sunday night with Paul's first missionary journey. He left Antioch to go plant churches, right? It's about what happens when a church starts right, when a church stays right, when a church stands right. That's what it's about. The door had been opened for the gospel to be given beyond the Jews. 
And what we see in, in Acts is that gospel message going away from the Jews. Now the Jews still got it, but going away in the sense that for the first time, Jew and Gentile were hearing the same message. The church in Jerusalem had acknowledged God's providential working through Peter in advancing the message and saving power of the gospel to the Gentile world. This, combined with the scattering of the believers after the death of Stephen, which we read, verse 19, okay, it resulted in Christians going back to their original homeland, right? They were scattered. Well, where else do you go if you're being scattered because of persecution? And Christians are being beheaded and, and murdered and, and just knocked off one by Where do you go? Well, you go where you know you can go, and you go home, right? You just go back to your homeland. So they're doing that. But God was using that to get the gospel to these other places. So what's the first, first task of the lo local church? Well, the first task of the local church, we see the church expanding, Okay. Um, verses 19 through 21, the church was spreading. It was expanding its borders. It was fulfilling its mission. Isaiah 54 says, Enlarge the place of thy tent, and let them stretch forth the curtains of thine habitation. Spare not, lengthen thy cords, and strengthen thy stakes. We're the salt of the earth, and we are going to be more effective when we're turned upside down and our contents are sprinkled Right? Think about salt on the table. It doesn't work no good just sitting there looking at it. Food still tastes funny. You've got to grab it. You've got to sprinkle the contents. Well, what's our content? As believers, what is our content? The gospel. We're the salt. What we have adds flavor and preservative. We have to expand. We have to take the message out. And that's what we're doing as we enter this busy season. But, but I want to make sure that we don't lose sight of what our purpose is. Our, t our attention in this passage is called to the fact that these believers who had been saved, they, they'd been saved, they'd been grounded and, and nurtured in the faith in Jerusalem, were going to strategic locations around the world. They were going to these strategic locations for the work of God. Makes sense when you understand that they belong to him. One of these key locations was Antioch. Antioch was uh, uh, estimated to be about the third uh, large. Had about 500,000 people, second only to uh, Rome and Alexandria. This place is huge. It was a prosperous city. It was an advanced city. Uh, wealthy people live there. Retired people live there. Where they is, I mean, it was just uh, a modern day uh, Fort Lauderdale, if you will. Right, a lot of money, a lot of retired folks. It was a place of architectural masterpieces. It wasn't just an ugly place. It was a beautiful place. It's it's it said that the main street was four miles long and completely paved with marble. It's nuts. It's a lot of money. Beautiful place, but it was a pagan place. It was a wicked city. It was the center of worship for the goddess Daphne. A lot of immoral practices, rituals, enticements. It was, a, it was a city of sin and wickedness. It was a city that had strategic influence. It was a city of cultural influence, business, commerce. But, but God, through the Holy Spirit, led some very simple, obedient servants to take the gospel. The church has to expand. Now, I'm not talking about numerical numbers here. Okay, I'm talking about the gospel going out. Because what we see in, in verse 20, the first part of verse 20, and some of them were men of Cyprus and Cyrene, which when they were come to Antioch, okay, it, it, the church was expanding because of this inward passion. 
We need to understand that we have an inward passion. We should have an inward passion to see. We're not doing all of these things in this busy season, this busy summer, for the sake of doing things. We've got plenty to do if we just want to be busy. We could clean all those woods out if we just wanted to be busy. We're entering a busy season for the purposes of sharing the gospel. We can't lose sight of the fact that that's our role, that's our purpose. We've got to get out. These men uh, in, of Cyprus and Cyrene, they, were, they, they, were, they traveled about 300 miles by foot to Jerusalem. Or from Jerusalem to get to Antioch. About 300 miles. It was that important for them to go. You can't, you can't do whatever it takes to share the gospel if you, don't ha- if you don't have passion. And it's passion that is necessary to build the church. If we don't have passion about the gospel and what we're doing and serving the Lord and just giving people an opportunity to hear a clear gospel presentation, if we don't have the passion to do that, we become a social club. We become a country club. We become a fellowship center. And that's not who we are. The fact of the matter is this. Without passion, we will not grow. No growing church, no thriving church has ever grown or been built without passion. If, if our passion dies during this busy season, we will die. We have to be passionate. Verse, the second part of verse 20, <clears throat> preaching the Lord Jesus. The church expanded because of its passion, but the, the church expanded because of inspirational, and uh, eh, I should have changed that word. The church expanded because of, of, of good biblical preaching. They preached in a way that it exalted God. Preaching was expository. They, they expounded unto them. Okay, so they tore it down and explained it in detail. But the preaching was exciting. The preaching was evangelistic. Remember what the Bible says. God's chosen the foolishness of preaching. People that are not born again, they don't understand. They're like, oh, that's silly. I love preaching. (laughs) I love it. You can think it's foolish all you want, but it's not. The vehicle of preaching is the biblical, what I mean by the vehicle of preaching, the the how we get the message out, okay? So it's the, how we deliver the message. The vehicle of preaching is the biblical tool for bringing us into worship with God. Now, you say, well, that's, you know, well, you're the preacher, so you're going to, no, that's scripture, verse 20, preaching the Lord Jesus. That's what they did. They preached. That was the focus. It was about Jesus. That's it. And if it's, if it's done the way that God intends for it, to be do, to, for it to be done, you can't help but get excited. You just can't. Verse 21, And the hand of the Lord was upon them, and a great number believed and turned unto the Lord. The church expanded because of an invisible power. So there's passion, preaching. Now remember, preaching is different than pastoring. Preaching is just part of what I do as a pastor. Preaching is proclaiming, okay? So not only the passion, not only the, the preaching, but the invisible power. The church had this invisible power that produced a constant and um, this constant irrefutable result. This the irrefutable in the sense you couldn't deny the working of the Holy Spirit. The listener couldn't deny it. There was something going on. The hand of the Lord, the hand of the Lord upon the, the preachers represents God's approval. The hand of the Lord, and as if you're sharing the gospel, you're preaching. Okay? You're proclaiming, you're declaring. But but what we see is in the passion. And, and, and following the scripture and being passionate and, and preaching the gospel, what we see there is this un, invisible power that people 
don't understand and they can't help but pay attention to because it, it's, it's an approval process, if you will, when God calls you out and gives you an opportunity to do that. It, it's God's stamp of approval almost. It's, this, this being or, it's, it's the idea of being ordained to share the gospel. Are you with me? It's, 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 <laughs> you're representing God's answer to all of their questions. You must be born again. That doesn't mean problems go away, and we're not going to get into that, but, but you understand, as, as, as aged believers, as, as experienced believers, you understand where all this is, right? And so we can go through these things rather quickly. But there's, there's this power that's based, that God is, has approved us to go and, and given us the power and the means to go. And so we have a confidence about us. Uh, we have the answers to the questions. Not our answers, God's answers, right? This is a power that is it's an invisible power. It's, it's the power of God into salvation. Secondly, we see in verse 22 to 26, the church enlisting. They enlisted a pastor, okay, and for time's sake, we won't unpack all of that, but they enlisted a pastor. Well, why do we see this, this enlisting, right, this enlistment? is because as a church is getting established, it needs structure. If, and it, when a church needs reestablished, it needs structure. God is a God of order. We need to be orderly. If we, we're his possession, right? So we need to be orderly. After a person gets saved, remember the work's just beginning, right? It takes time. It's a process. Here we see a second key component of the work of the church, and that's enlisting. The church at Jerusalem had been strategically kept in the loop about the successful results in Antioch, okay? So things are taking place, and things are going on, and hey, we've, we've brought in pastors. That's growth, Okay? But you're enlisting pastors, so you're bringing in a, a man of God who has been uh, selected in, with 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1. A man who is spiritual, he, his character, he's a good man. His content, is that he's full of the Holy Ghost. His confidence is that he is a man of faith. He's seen the grace of God and been glad, verse 23. He has exhorted the people. He exhorts the people with purpose of heart that they would leave behind a sinful life and cleave to the Lord. The way that he speaks to them, verse 23. They bring in pastors. They, they, they bring in, uh, they enlist partners, verse 25 and 26. This is the idea of teamwork, and we see this, right? Think about Moses and Joshua. Moses couldn't do it by himself. God sent him a partner. What about Elijah and Elisha? Needed a partner. The work of the church is to be evangelistic. But the fact of the matter is this, is Brother Cecil can't reach everyone. Miss Cherry can't reach everyone. Miss Sammy can't teach everyone reach everyone, right, and so on and so forth. We need to partner. There's elements of the ministry that we all have abilities for, that God, God given abilities. That's why he's placed us here. We, we kind of unpacked that a little bit last week. But it's also, while, the, while our, the work of the church is to be evangelistic, it's also to be balanced in its enlistment and recruitment of those who are uh, w working within the ministry, okay? So there ha still has to be a balance. It doesn't mean you just throw everyone into every position, right? Some people may not be ready. But what are we getting at with this? With this, with this building? What are we getting at with this idea of the church enlisting? What's the old saying? It takes a village. Is that it? It takes a village. For us to, to share the gospel, for us to be the church that God wants us to be, we have to remember it takes, it, it takes a village. 
It takes all of us. I mean, think, imagine what food would taste like if Brother Cecil wasn't the one on the grill. Right? And I know that's silly. It's something silly, and it's just cooking, right? We're here for more spiritual things. I understand that, but, but that's still, it has to get done. One person can't do it all. And that's good for us to remember as we go into this busy season. Man, I am so tired. You might be that key element. Hey, we're going to get plenty of rest once snow hits. Okay? That's just life around here. Right? About Halloween time. We're done. Right? We were telling Izzy today about Halloween. You just, you're done. It's too cold. You just stay inside. Right? And you don't come out till May. Right? We're a bunch of bears up here. Are you with me, though? I mean, that's the truth. It takes us all, and we're going to get tired. But remember that one of the tasks of the local church is enlisting. We need help, and you might be that key element. Lastly, uh, the church is exemplifying. Verse 26 through 29, the church uh, was exemplary in receiving, and it came to pass. 26, and it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves together with the church and taught much people. There was discipleship and equipping opportunities that were uh, established that, that helped to ground and indoctrinate the people who were getting saved. They were able to be assimilated into the body, right? Made, brought in. But it, it, was, it, was, it, was a, it was exemplary in receiving them, bringing them in. Remember that as things get busy. We need to, ex in an exemplary way, receive people. Spend time with them. Talk with them. Get to know them. The church was exemplary in its reputation. Verse 26, continuing verse 26. And the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. They began to be referred to as what? Christians. Followers of Jesus, those who are Christ-like, meaning they did it the way Jesus did it. Did they make mistakes? Sure they did. Have we made mistakes? Sure we have. Can we do better? Sure we can. But we have to remember who we are. We have to remember what we're here for. Lastly, the church was exemplary in its responsiveness. Verse 29, then, then the disciples, every man according to his ability, determined to send relief unto the brethren which dwelt in Judah, every man according to his ability. They didn't just disregard what was going on in other places. They responded. I don't know what that's going to look like for us. I couldn't even think of an illustration if I had to. In a, practi a practical illustration. Other than you might be the one person that gives another person a break just by being faithful, just by taking care of people. Maybe, we, maybe we'll have somebody just so busy, they're running 100 different miles, miles an hour, and, it would be in, and you're doing everything you can, and you say, you know what, they are tired. Maybe I could go do something for them. I don't know. I don't know what it would look like. But it was responsive. Church was responsive. It saw needs and did what it had to do to meet those needs. And I think that's something we do really good at with our guests, with our missionaries and guest preachers. And even in the time that, short time that I've been here, we've done a really good job with that, in my opinion, seeing a need and doing what, the, doing what we can to, to help them and respond to that need. And we're going to have to do that over this busy season. But we might have needs right here. Right? We might. We might have needs right here where we need help. So this is, again, these are just things to help us and some things to remind us. Because Acts 11 gives us a model of a church that God blesses. He blessed the church. He blesses a church that going out, sharing the gospel. He blesses a church that is enlisting, bringing in people to, to serve and to lead and to teach and to grow and to disciple, and, right? He does that. He blesses those churches. The churches that are 
that are enlisting help. And he blesses churches that are exemplifying. Churches that aren't neglecting others to include themselves. Nothing crazy tonight. Just something that my heart's desire would be helpful for us moving, moving forward. Something as we go into this busy season would just be just some short, very simple things from Scripture just to, to keep on the back burner, as they say, because it's going to get busy and it's going to get crazy. I uh, was looking at the schedule today and just, I was trying to find a day to, to take Izzy sightseeing if she wants to go to Boston or New York City or whatever. And I'm, I told Christy, I said, I don't know when we're going to pull that off. We're just busy. And now we, we will. Don't get me wrong. We've got the time. I'm just saying it's busier than I even expected. Trying to schedule the contractor for the parking lot. Say, well, here, because we're going to need it. We're going to, right? It's a lot. Well, we can put a camper on the grass and need, you, I mean, it's nuts. Right? We're busy. And it doesn't slow down in July. Okay? It doesn't slow down. July 11th. We will have um, our snack. We're going to move snack from July 11th to, or from July 4th to July 11th, right? That's the following week. We'll have our final vacation Bible school meeting. Can you believe that? Why do you say our final? Because VBS starts the following week. Do you remember that means next week we start advertising vacation Bible school? Think about it. And it doesn't even come. For a month almost. So we'll, we'll have, we'll roll right into a week after. So we'll postpone snack for a week. And a week after that, we go to vacation Bible school. Uh-huh. No, we're going to have snack. We're just going to postpone it a week. <laughs> we're going to eat, brother. But think about that. And then we turn around. At the end of Vacation Bible School, and we have about two weeks to breathe. And then we have boot camp. And then my family leaves for 10 days. And then we come back, and we've got a missionary, boom, right out the gate that, very, that Sunday after we get back. Brother Burton Gates will be here. You see what I'm getting at? It's going to be busy. We've got to stay faithful. Watch out for one another. Keep an eye on one another. Don't let one another get burnt out. We have people prone to turn into workaholics. We don't need it. It's not helpful. Guard them, protect them, step in. Let, it, let them get a break. Let them get a breather. Okay? So just remember, these are, this is a church that God blesses is a church that is preaching the gospel, putting people to work, and watching out for others. Okay? And, and it's more detailed than that, but to summarize and to put it simply, okay? So we're going to go ahead and uh, we'll, we'll wrap this up for tonight. I did want to talk just briefly. Uh,